Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for, for coming, uh, everyone. So the, the goal is to talk about a little bit about expansion. And uh, very broadly speaking, uh, expansion is some form of randomness or pseudo-randomness. And uh, th th there is a very particular manifestation that's very important for us, is in the study of uh, expander graphs, the, the expansion of graphs. So let, let's start from the beginning. So uh, a, a graph here for us is a collection of, of vertices and edges. And let's assume for simplicity that you have something that's regular. So the number of edges incident in each vertex is the same. In this case, it's three, right? Uh, so, okay. And uh, it's very common to associate to a graph the adjacent matrix, or in this case, you're going to associate the normalized adjacent matrix. So it's a matrix in that indexed by the vertices here. And uh, for a pair IJ, we put a one over D if it's an edge and zero otherwise. So to give an example here, if you have this very simple graph, a triangle, it's a normalized adjacent matrix would so look something like this. Everyone is connected except the, the vertex with itself and you have the degree two. So have this normalization of one over two. Okay, so that's a very simple example. And algebraic properties of this matrix will tell us we'll review some properties of the graph, right? Uh, and vice versa. So it's a very useful representation for us. And, um, and at a very qualitative level, an expander tries to combine two opposing properties. You want something to be very well connected and at the same time to be quite sparse. So uh, at a qualitative level, this is what we want. And there are many ways of playing around with, with expanders, and we are going to take this spectral role. You can play in terms of combinatorics and also in terms of probability. So, but let, let's focus on, on the spectral part. And uh, to address that, let, let's consider, since you're playing with deregular graphs, a very important direction for us is the all ones direction, because it's always a, a, an eigenvector of eigenvalue one of the normalized adjacent matrix. So if, if, if you take, for example, our triangle and you apply to, to, to the all-ones uh, vector, you get the all-ones vector with, with one. And uh, we, we have this uh, real symmetric matrix. It has real eigenvalues. Uh, the, the row sum to one is a probability distribution. And we know that the eigenvalues are between one and minus one. We know that one is always realized. And uh, to define a notion of expansion, we, you can define this parameter here. So you can look at the second eigenvalue absolute value and the last one and consider the maximum. This is going to give us a number between zero and one. And that, that's going to be the spectral expansion for us. Okay, and uh, here in our example of a triangle, so we have one as an eigenvalue, uh, minus half and minus a half, so lambda is, is a half for our triangle. Okay, uh, very good. And for us, a lambda expander is going to be uh, any graph such that this expansion parameter is at, is at most lambda. And uh, to give some intuition of uh, what, what this parameter is trying to track, so the, the, the spectral theorem tells us that you do not only have eigenvalues, but you also have an orthogonal basis here. Right, uh, so in particular, we can diagonalize this guy. And the very convenient mental picture here is to think, oh, we have this lambda one that's one, and everything else is very small, right? Uh, so we, as we take powers of this, you have a very fast exponential decay, right? Uh, okay, so an another way of seeing this, right? If, if you have the adjacent matrix, we single out the top eigenvector, and you have the remaining parts. If this lambda parameter is small, in terms of operator norm, it's as if our adjacent matrix is going to behave very similarly to this one order product one divided by n which is essentially the adjacent matrix of a very dense, complete, well-connected graph, right? Uh, okay, so we have this, it's trying to approximate in the spectral sense of a very well-connected graph. Now you can make things more quantitative, right? Uh, so you can, the opposing properties that we have, you can, uh, we can ask this expansion parameter to be quite small, and this sparseness we are going to measure by the degree. So you want the degree to be quite small as well, okay? Uh, very good. And what are the reasons why people study uh, this base, but so they are extremely useful for uh, constructing error correcting codes. Uh, so we have expander codes of Citrus Spielman that are used in, in practice. So some of the major theorems in computer science can be proved using uh, um, the expanders. If you want to construct some explicit object or remove the randomness of some algorithm, you, you, you can use expanders. In the algorithm design, sometimes you have an arbitrary graph, it's convenient to split into expanding pieces that we know how to analyze. There are beautiful constructions in themselves, like the zigzag and so on. We have hardness of approximation. They're saying how well algorithms can approximate certain, certain problems. We have sampling and count, like um, some models, like the hardcore model. We have number theory applications, some sieve methods. We have combinatorics that we have seen from Matia, Zerdo de Calai. So th there are many uses of, of expanders, right? Um, and uh, to, to illustrate this, I would like to present three uh, concrete problems where expansion plays a very crucial role, right? Um, so the first one is, is a very simple. So let's say that you are given some sort of maze 
and we would like to understand if you can escape this maze. Okay, so how you model this problem? We can model as a graph, right? Uh, we are given a main vertex graph. You are given an starter ver vertex S and the target vertex T that you'd like to reach along using edges of G, right? And then can you uh, can, can you reach T starting from S, right? Uh, that, that's a, a computational question. And uh, if you're given a global view of this maze, this question is very easy. Uh, we, you can simply try all possibilities, and that, that, that's a very simple problem, right? Uh, even computationally. But but now let's add a, a constraint. L let's say that uh, we've, we have a bounded amount of memory. L let's say that the number of bits that you're allowed to use in trying to traverse this maze is very tiny. So you're, you're sort of a, a small guy sitting on the vertex of this huge graph, and the only thing that you have is log n bits. And what is log n bits here? Is the, the equivalent of, of being able to store constantly many verts of this maze? And can, can you somehow deterministically escape from, from, from a maze like this using the equivalent of the only uh, the, this number of bits? So if you try to think about this problem, it's, it's highly non trivial, right? Uh, and um, uh, very surprisingly, uh, Rainbow showed that it, it, it is possible. So that there is a deterministic algorithm that if it's possible to reach T from S, uh, it's going to do that using just log in uh, bits of memory. It's a very, very efficient, uh, memory efficient algorithm. Okay, so this is uh, one important result for us. And um, uh, another very important, okay. And to, to say a few things about the technique. So <laughs> the idea is to transform the input graph that's arbitrary into an expander, a bounded degree expander graph. And you can do it as an exercise that if you have a bounded degree expander graph, this problem is not too hard. But you need to transform it very locally and very carefully because you only have log n bits, right? You cannot afford to transform it. We use a lot of space to transform this graph. Okay, so that's roughly this uh, how this is solved. Um, another problem is about the uh, concerns proof verification, right? Uh, uh, how efficient can you verify a proof, right? Uh, so you are very used to when you, you are given a proof, you need to read it entirely to, to have some confidence whether it's correct or not, right? And it's a very time-consuming process, right? Uh, if you are given this proof. And uh, a, dream, a, a dream scenario would be if it would be enough to only read constantly many symbols of this proof, whether to check whether it's correct or not. Let's say that you give this huge paper and it's enough to read, I don't know, the, the first and the last claim to have some confidence that it's correct, <laughs> right? Uh, it seems crazy, right? Uh, and with two concessions, this is possible, uh, okay? With two, two concessions, this uh, utopia is, is possible. And the idea is that this proof is going to be rewritten and th th there is an efficient way of rewriting this proof. And the second concession is that you're not going to do a, have a deterministic algorithm to verify that. You're going to have a probabilistic algorithm. It's going to toss some coins and decide where to look inside this proof. But it's only going to read constantly many bits of this proof, right? And the other probability is tiny, potentially much better than what, as, as we referees, would be able to, to, to do, right? Uh, and th this is called the PCP theorem, probabilistic che checkable proof. And uh, it, it's considered a major result in, in TCS because it's, it's related to hardness of approximation. Uh, so if you want to understand the, how well can approximate certain problems, it's related to this abstract book guy. So this is a major achievement of, of TCS. Okay? And uh, the, the proof already used expansion, but later in 2005, Dinur gave a proof that really relies on expanders. Uh, this alternative proof that's a very elegant proof. And what's going on here? So if you have a proof that has some errors, the idea is that you're going to take an expander to propagate those errors, if there are errors, and then you repeat. You propagate the errors gradually, 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 and at the end of this process, the errors are going to be all over the place. So no matter where you look at the end, you're going to, to, to detect the error. And, and the, the, the key component is some sort of a expander. Very good. And uh, the third question that, that I would like to discuss is uh, under which circumstances we, we can get almost optimal expanders, right? Uh, and uh, let, uh, let's see what, what uh, what, what this is about. And uh, we recently showed with Metal, Roy, and Vic Derrickson that uh, every expander graph can be transformed into an almost optimal expander uh, in a way that preserves the structure of, of the expander. Okay? And let's quantify a little bit what we mean by uh, almost optimal in this context, right? Um, so uh, expansion is, is, uh, is something great, but you need to pay for expansion, right? If you want, want to have a lambda expander, you want the degree to be at least one over lambda squared. So it's a resource that you need to pay. If you want to have a graph that expands by lambda, the degree needs to be at least one over lambda squared. And, and, and this is the best kind of trade-off that you could hope for. And there are graphs that do achieve this kind of trade-off, right? Uh, so there are the so-called Ramanujan graphs. 
that achieve a, a quadratic like tra trade off between degree and, and expansion. And, and they are the best of the best. They are the, the perfect graph trying to mimic somehow infinite trees. Um, and we do have nice constructions, uh, one from Bot, Phillips, and Sarnak, and independent by Margulis, showing that those beasts indeed exist. And that's a great gift from uh, mathematics to computer science. People use those things all over the place uh, in TCS. So it's great that you have them. Right, uh, so they, they are the best of the best. And uh, okay. Yeah, so our theorem, what we're going to get is not exactly Ramanujan, exactly Ramanujan, but it's starting from an arbitrary expander, you're going to get something that's almost Ramanujan in some sense that we need to quantify, right? Uh, and uh, let's try to make more precise. When you talk about expanders, you really need to talk about an, an infinite time of press, but let's keep things simple. So if you're given a bounded degree uh, expander graph, let's say that this lambda naught is a constant, and for any target lambda, any target expansion that you want to achieve, you can transform the, the, this input expander in a new one uh, in a way that it becomes a lambda expander that you want, and the degree is about quadratically off. So it's one over lambda square uh, plus, plus, plus some little. Okay? So that, that, that's the theorem that you prove. And precisely because we preserve the structure of the graph, whenever, for instance, if you start with a Kelly graph over some group, you end up with a Kelly graph over the same group. So whenever you have an expanding group in the sense that has a, an expanding Kelly graph, you know that there is going to be almost from Ramanujan generators. For instance, if you take the, the symmetric group that for a long time people did not know if, whether it would be expanding or not, and in case above in around 2005 showed that, okay, we do have uh, expanding generators, but we do not know, it, it, the, the quality was nowhere near close the Ramanujan bound. And applying these techniques, you can so, show that, okay, the symmetric group has almost Ramanujan expanders, right? Uh, uh, and then all non abelian finite simple groups, we also have a, a, a your proofs constructed? Very constructed, very efficient. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you have something that's strongly explicit, you're going to have something that's also strongly explicit. Uh, okay. And what is the technique behind this? It's a form of operator amplification. So Tashma had some construction that applies to a scalar value function. Here, you're going to have matrix valid functions. So you're given a finite set, a parameter lambda naught, a dimension parameter. And for any target lambda, we can efficiently construct a single collection S that is going to have about the correct size, such that for any matrix valid function, those are L by L matrices. If the, the average of the operator norm of, of, of this function is at most lambda naught, you're going to have a function on, on this collection of, of tuples, right? You're going to look at each tuple and you're going to multiply, right? And like this, you're, you're going to compute the operator norm, it's going to be at most lambda. And lambda, it's much smaller, let's say, than lambda naught. So the, 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 this is the, the, the main technical uh, component that's going on there. And th there are two very curious features in this, right? It's completely dimension independent. So you can amplify, it doesn't matter the dimension of the matrices. Uh, if you try to do this using some naive form of a uh, matrix turn of bound, you pay huge factors in the dimension. So this is an explicit thing that it's dimension independent. And the second the curious uh, feature is that it, this W is sort of universal. So single collection W that you construct, it can amplify finitely many functions. So you construct it once very explicitly and boof, it, it amplifies everything for you. Uh, yeah, so th this is the main technical thing. So all, all in all, uh, I think expansion is a very powerful spice, extremely useful in applications. And yeah, if, if you want to play with expansion, please let, let me know. And that, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Are your methods related to the sparsification methods of Spielman and uh, his co -work? No, 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 not directly. It's related to some efficient code constructions, that, so, so, so some constructions that achieve almost the JV bound. Um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a matrix version of, of uh, those methods. Yeah, the, 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 those methods of Spielman, Marcus, and Trust, they are very good in the sense that they really give Ramanujan, Ramanujan. Ah, uh, yeah, right. But I remember that before that they had. Uh, some a factor of two, two Romanians. Oh, uh, they could sparsify uh, any graph uh -huh. using quadratic forms on uh, yeah, or, or almost is, is very far from a constant true. True, 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 true,
the, 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 the one underlying technique that we know the three problems that I mentioned is some form of zigzag uh, construction, right? Uh, and then if you put phrase some zigzag construction for high dimension expanders, it would be great. But I think it would be potential baby step to, to, towards achieving that. And I, I do not know many good ways of phrasing zigzag in the context of high dimension expanders. But I think it's a great question. Okay, there doesn't seem to be any other question. Thank you.